Smith from the Max Planck Institute for Astrophysics. Fabian got his undergraduate degree from the Humboldt University in 2005 and PhD at the University of Chicago in 2009, uh, working with uh, Scott Southerton and Wayne Hu. He then moved to uh, um, Caltech as a Moore postdoctoral fellow and then Smithson as an Einstein fellow before he moved back to Europe to join the Max Planck Institute uh, as a uh, Fortune's group and uh, permanent scientific staff. Uh, Fabian's research uh, spans a wide area uh, in theoretical cosmology, theoretical and observational cosmology. He has worked on a lot on um, most biogravity theory, early universe, large scale structure, uh, relativistic effect, uh, many things, and recently uh, a lot on modeling galaxy bias. He has made a great impact in all of these areas. And if you work in any of these areas, you can easily find, you know, his paper very well cited uh, as, a, as a reference in, in those fields. Uh, but you may, and of course you may, recognize his name with, uh, with the book, uh, The Modern Cosmology, uh, one of the most popular and uh, well-written uh, textbook in cosmology. He's the co-author of this textbook. So uh, without further ado, uh, it is my, uh, I'm very happy to have him here today and he will tell us about Java Cosmology. Thanks, Jail. Thanks for the very uh, kind introduction. And thanks to Francesca for inviting me to this seminar. So um, first technicalities I'm going to use. Unfortunately, I can't point on Zoom, so I will use this old fashioned analog pointer. But I hope everything else uh, will be is showing nicely on Zoom and later on YouTube as well. So I'm going to talk about work that we've been doing over the past um, four years. Uh, so it's been a long term project to develop new approaches to galaxy clustering. And there's a number of people involved, uh, including current and former PhD students and postdocs and uh, long term collaborators, uh, Jens Yasha and Guillaume Laveau. And we're doing this work in context of this Aquila Consortium, which is basically focused on new inference approaches to large scale structure. Um, but uh, before I get into all these technicalities, let me provide a broader introduction. Um, so what I um, mean with, uh, so clustering of galaxies basically means we look at galaxy redshift surveys. So we have redshifts and positions on the sky of a number of galaxies, hundreds of thousands or a million of galaxies. And those provide us basically a 3D map of the galaxy distribution. And it's been actually historically used um, as a key probe of cosmology. Um, so it's, it, this field has a long history. So there were some interesting papers in the early 90s that already said that the galaxy clustering observations made at that time combined with the COBE measurement of the CMB quadrupole, so very minimal CMB measurements already imply that we need something like a, a cosmological constant. Um, but I mean, this field has expanded vastly and there are a lot of surveys underway or, or planned or being built, um, DESI, PFS, uh, as ground-based surveys, LSST, ground-based SPHEREX and Euclid satellites, and so on. So, you know, obviously uh, those will deliver a lot of data and we want to extract cosmology from it. So the nice thing about galaxy clustering is that it's really a 3D measurement. As I said, it provides us a 3D map of galaxies uh, on our past light cone. So in principle, we can probe this uh, quite substantial volume, um, not all the way back to... Uh, uh, the last scattering surface where the CMB is, of course, but um, the late time universe, whereas the cosmic microwave background is a 2D measurement, right? Because it's it's one surface. So in principle, it offers a lot more information, but it's also more challenging. But so in general, let me just provide a brief outline of the science goals that we have, even though my talk itself will not be about any of these goals, because I'm really going to talk about the method to extract cosmologic information less than what we actually have extracted. Um, right, so uh, so inflation is the, is the epoch in the early universe that we believe happened that generated um, the initial conditions for structure in the universe. So obviously this is very unclear what actually happened physically during inflation. And uh, we, in cosmology, we aim to reconstruct um, 
basically what happened, the physics during that time. And uh, one way to do that is to look for um, the properties of the density perturbations that initialized the structure and gravitational waves, which we summarize in, in the standard framework with these parameters N, S, and R. So I'm just writing the parameters here. I'm not going to explain what all of these are. Um, then in the late universe, uh, we know the universe is accelerating. So there's something driving the accelerated expansion, which uh, commonly we call dark energy, but it could also be a modification of gravity. And it's interesting to see that the growth structure um, in the universe that we observe with galaxy clustering depends both on the expansion history and uh, the nature of gravity. So I'm writing here the equation governing the scale independent um, linear growth of structure in the universe. Again, I'm going to skip the details, but you see here the Hubble rate appearing, which basically can tell us about the dark energy equation of state. But we also have Newton's gravitational constant appearing, a sign that if we modify gravity, we will also modify this, this growth. And finally, um, dark matter, which is really uh, what uh, dominates the uh, formation of structure in the universe. And large-scale structure can tell us about, hopefully, a bit more about what this dark matter is, how cold it is. And uh, for example, I also included neutrinos in here. They're not dark matter, but we know they exist. We know they have mass. We want to measure their um, total mass, the absolute mass scale of neutrinos, which probably cosmology is the only way to do that. So obviously, there's a whole ton of things that we, we can do. But uh, the main challenge we're facing is that if we could make this map of, of the 3D galaxy structure, um, that map is nice. But to extract information from it, we need to understand it, right? We have to have a physical model for um, how this galaxy distribution arises. And this is very challenging because every photon from galaxies that we observe is not a, a small perturbation around some smooth universe. It's a, the result of very uh, complex, highly nonlinear process. And for you know, if we observe the light of stars, we need to understand in principle how stars form, right? And uh, uh, in what environment stars form when galaxies uh, have this or that stellar mass and all this stuff, which is extremely complicated. And even people doing full galaxy formation simulations of small volumes don't claim they can they understand this in detail. On the other hand, the cosmic background is beautiful because uh, here this is a plot of the uh, CMB temperature um, map from Planck. And uh, what's beautiful about this is that uh, it's small perturbations around a perfect black body, right? So you're really in a regime where you just have to look at tiny fluctuations around the background universe. And really, that's why the CMB is so valuable uh, to us is because we can really understand everything. So the goal really is to have something approaching that for large scale structure as well, right? To really make it something that we can exploit for cosmology. So hence, uh, the first goal of my talk will be to show that we can deal with these complexities of galaxy formation that I mentioned um, rigorously on large scales. So if we restrict to the smooth map, to a large scale 3D map, we can actually do this rigorously. And then even if we do that, even if we restrict to these large scales, um, I hope to show that we have much more information in galaxy clustering than what we're using uh, up to this point. Great, so um, part one, um, for that I need to, um, should also give a bit of background. So uh, as I mentioned, the formation of structure in the universe is dominated by cold dark matter. And uh, so basically uh, what that means is that we can neglect non-gravitational forces, which is a really good approximation of large scales because the gene scale of the gas is going to be much smaller than um, the scales we're looking at. So that's already a major simplification, right? On large scales, we can neglect non-gravitational forces. And what, what that means is in the end, we, um, to solve, uh, to make a prediction for a structure formation, we're solving for the evolution of cold collisionless matter under gravity. Collisionless just meaning there's no um, non-gravitational forces. And this is um, technically the vlasov poisson system of equations. So vlasov equation governing um, the 
the evolution of the matter um, distribution function um, or the particle distribution, one particle distribution function and the Poisson equation supplying the gravity side. And so in this field, um, there have been um, a lot of effort in uh, solving this efficiently using n-body simulation, which is a beautiful technique. And this is really a workhorse uh, tool for us is to use n-body simulations. Um, this is a slice through such an n-body simulation run at MPA a while ago, um, like 17 years ago now, the Millennium Simulation. And uh, so this is a visualization of the matter density in this simulation. But keep in mind, this is no stars, no galaxies, right? This is only gravity. But there's already incredibly rich structure that you see. I mean, you can see, um, obviously, these, these over very dense regions um, uh, connected by filaments. And in between, you have these um, under dense regions that we call voids. Um, so it's a very rich structure that emerges uh, out of just collisionless evolution under gravity. Um, so, of course, to run a simulation like that, we need some form of initial conditions. And there, the CMB um, is very useful because it already, um, you know, we usually base our initial conditions on the inflationary scenario, but this is really supported by the CMB, namely that um, the initial conditions, the initial matter fluctuations are um, scale invariant, adiabatic, and approximately Gaussian. So these are a lot of technical terms, but this is really, um, if you dive into it, you'll see that this is the simplest possible initial conditions you think, think of. Basically, just the scale invariant, the potential is governed by a scale invariant um, Gaussian initial um, Gaussian random field. And so what this implies, these initial conditions make a number of very important uh, predictions. So number one is that um, the large scale fluctuations had the least time to grow in the universe because they entered the horizon at the latest. And so they're still linear today, right? And you can actually see this in the simulation already by eye, right? If you think of a really large scale density perturbation, that would basically mean that the overdensity in this area is very different from here. But you can see that they're basically statistically equivalent, these two, two areas, right? There's no sign of large-scale perturbations here. And that's just precisely the statement. The large-scale fluctuations are small. And so what happens is that the smallest scales um, evolve fastest, and they, um, or they have the longest time to evolve. And they form bound structures like these, these overdensies, these big overdensies that we call dark matter halos, um, which are fully nonlinear objects. Um, and then these halos start small and begin to, to hierarchically assemble to larger and larger halos. But the large scales remain um, relatively, um, so the density perturbations mean are, are small, which means we can do a perturbative expansion in the large scale density fluctuations. So this is another, um, a more quantitative plot. So this shows the, the uh, variance of, um, density, matter density fluctuations in the logarithmic wave number bin as a function of this wave number, right? So on the left, you have large scale perturbations, small wave numbers. On the right, you have small scale perturbations. And you see, obviously, the small scale perturbations are significantly larger. And so if you pick a given time in the universe expansion history that we quantify with this redshift, um, there is a particular scale at which this quantity crosses one, right, this line. And when it crosses one, that means, roughly speaking, that's where structures become very nonlinear, and we can't hope to um, describe them perturbatively. We can, of course, look at n-body simulations. But again, recall that these don't include any gas physics. They don't form stars. They don't form galaxies. So you can't really use these simulations to make any predictions for galaxy clustering. Right. And technically speaking, this is the linear power spectrum. So it's the, the linear theory prediction. So if you actually did a fully nonlinear calculation, the real power would, uh, would, would be a bit higher than that. But so basically, um, this, this is really the starting point for our uh, theory of galaxy clustering. Um, because the idea is that we uh, restrict, we basically coarse grain or smooth the map on some scale 
lambda, which I'll introduce in a second. And then we only look at uh, wave uh, modes uh, at a wave number smaller than that, scales larger than that, and then everything should be under control in perturbation theory. So, and the key point uh, I will make is again, uh, is that the same we can do for, for galaxy clustering, okay? So this, this theory we're gonna develop is not restricted to just describing matter, it's, it can also describe galaxies. The price uh, we pay for this um, generality, for this flexibility of also describing galaxies is that we have to introduce free coefficients or counter terms um, that we call bias parameters and stochastic amplitudes. Um, right, so what's the idea? So the idea is, as I said, we introduce uh, the scale lambda and then split our initial perturbations into large scales that are uh, below lambda and small scales that are above lambda. And then we integrate out the small scale. So this, if you, for the people who have any familiarity with field theory, you have, might have encountered this when you study renormalization group is um, this idea of successively integrating out uh, the small scale modes. It's exactly analogous to, to field theory. And in field theory, you also cut um, on the momenta of the linear propagator and the same, this corresponds to cutting on the linear initial density field in this case. And then we say, okay, uh, I don't know what these modes are doing. They're uh, fully nonlinear. I don't have a UV theory speaking in field theory terms. And so I want to integrate these out and only look at modes below uh, lambda. Uh, so I'm not gonna uh, talk in detail about how we do this. It's in fact very complicated because um, the linear a density field is already quite complicated. Um, uh, but yeah, let me let me give the gist of it. So basically, um, there are two, as I already mentioned, there are two free types of free coefficients we have to allow for. And the first one you call bias parameters. So these um, incorporate the effect of these large scale modes uh, that we keep on uh, the galaxy, on the large scale galaxy density, right? So if I have a galaxy that forms in some overdense region of the universe um, by you know, the gas cooling and forming stars and so on and so forth, uh, we know that that probability of forming a galaxy there will de depend on, for example, the large scale density, right? So if I have, um, if I'm in a more dense region, then it's easier to form a galaxy because I have more matter available, also more baryons available. And, and so similarly, there are, there are many other such terms and we can systematically derive which, which ones we need to include. And so, yeah, so we have this list of fields or operators, uh, O, um, that are, again are fields, but we know how to construct them out of the um, delta lambda field that we can predict. And then we just multiply them with three coefficients and let the data tell us what these coefficients are. Um, of course, uh, this will not uh, exactly tell me like what the galaxy density field is, because we're not, um, our model isn't exact, there is scatter around this relation, there's noise. And so we have to add, uh, allow for this noise field, which just arises from the fact that at every position where a galaxy forms, um, you know, it, the, the, the actual question, you know, the actual fact whether galaxy forms or not, is dependent on what the small scale perturbations at that location are. So I'm gonna get a bit more technical because I know there are some people in the room who really uh, know a lot about this, uh, but then you know I'll, I'll get more general again uh, later in the talk. So, um, so what do we precisely need to include when we think of these bias terms, right? I mean, at, at this point, it's very abstract. So let me, uh, so if you think of an observed galaxy residing at this position, right? So the, if you follow the center of mass of the, of the stuff that formed this galaxy, you can form it or trace it back in, um, to the initial conditions. It just follows some geodesic in the perturbed space time. And I can also sketch um, sort of the entire region out of which uh, this material comes as this uh, this kind of shaded area, right? So the whole material moves as the under large scale perturbations as it collapses to form a galaxy. 
But by the equivalence principle, all of this material moves at the same rate under large scale gravitational force, right? That's Einstein's elevator uh, thought experiment. So then, uh, so then if I think of this picture, what um, do I have to include in the bias expansion? So we already talked about the matter density, right? I mean, if I have more matter density, I have more stuff available to make the galaxy, it'll probably be bigger and more likely to be selected. And all of this we need to incorporate, right? But it won't only depend on the uh, matter density here, it would also depend on the matter density along the entire past history, right? Because galaxy formation is not a fast process, it's something that um, you need to really um, follow through the entire growth history to, to um, capture all the effects. So galaxies form over billions of years because, for example, uh, stars have lifetimes of billions of years, right? So the stars that we observe in our galaxy, a lot of them are 5 billion years old. So they formed, uh, you know, the their formation conditions were governed by the environment 5 billion years ago, very roughly speaking. So, um, so basically to, to summarize, we um, need to include the matter density. I also need to include the tidal field, which I didn't talk about, but you can think of it as a similar thing as the matter density. It's something that's locally observable. And time and space derivatives. Time derivatives, as I said, explained because the formation happens over long time scales, so I need to include the full evolution. And spatial derivatives eventually, because as we look at smaller scale perturbations, they begin to probe the region that this is a finite region from which the material comes. Okay, so this is a bit technical, but um, so just to, to summarize um, or, or to make an important point here is that you might think, okay, this is a huge number of contributions I have to include in my galaxy density, I lose all the information. Right? I mean, there's no chance of doing cosmology with it. Not true, because there are actually particular types of terms that are protected that don't have free coefficients. And those exactly correspond to this effect that everything, all the stuff that makes up the galaxy and the, the matter around it is moving at the same rate under large scale perturbations. So that yields to some contributions that are protected and that we can basically um, are safe to use to, to get cosmology. Um, right, so um, just to for the, the real experts um, to, to do this in practice, uh, we can, we again use a perturbative expansion. So say we have some maximum order capital N um, and there's this, in Lagrangian perturbation theory, we have this distortion tensor, which basically describes how um, the flow of matter along the trajectory is distorted from the initial conditions to the final time. And then we can make up all the terms. Um, it's kind of magical. We can make up all the terms just by combining orders of these, of these tensors, all, this, all the scalar invariants. So as you can see, there is, there's a certain number at fixed order and that number keeps growing towards higher order but it the main thing is yes is it, uh, are you claiming this is a fully general uh, implementation of all the possible effects or is it exactly well it's an uh, it means it says that the um you know at some point we have to stop right we say we say i go to third order that means i include the, the first three lines and I don't include the fourth line, and then you can compute how big is the effect if I were if I would include the next higher order. And if that is much smaller than the third order, then you're in a regime where you can say, okay, it um there are for sure this is an approximation, a perturbative expansion, but we know that the next higher order is suppressed. I understand that's a perturbative, I understand. Yes. Do you include an effect? Let's suppose you have a galaxy. And you have next to it another galaxy, and the light from the first galaxy affects how the you know the radiation from the first galaxy affects how the second galaxy forms. Right. So very non-obvious things are they included in this? Uh, yes, they are included. If you say okay, um, the the radiation travels only within a region of a certain size, right? Because of the optical depth, for example. And so uh, then, as long as they stick to scales that are much larger than this, the size of this region, then this is all captured. 
However, if the mean free path is 100 megaparsec, and that really is a significant effect, then this region would become huge, and you would basically not be able to describe galaxy clustering uh, within 100 megaparsec, which would be very bad, right? So, uh, but this is basically the only effect uh, that could lead to such a large um, radial dependence. And we have looked at this. We've tried to see what one can do. It's it's very difficult to incorporate this exactly um, in the fully general case because again, you have to consider like um, the whole history of of both of emission and reception of this light that you were talking about. So basically, the short answer is yes. We are relying on there being a scale that that I call R star, describing the size of this region, and that it's fine to work outside of that scale. Any more questions? Right. So this, I just wanted to show that you know there are uh, we know what these contributions are and how to write them down, and in particular, given a uh, a linear matter density field, which basically describes M1, I can construct all of these uh, straightforwardly. Good. And then, so this was bias. The other uh, aspect is stochasticity or noise, right? So as I said, um, these large scale fields can only um, describe statistically like what, what the expected number of galaxy is in a given region, but it won't say exactly, you know, in this uh, voxel I will uh, of the observed universe, I will see exactly two galaxies, right? There will only give an expectation value for the the number density of galaxies in there. So we have to include noise. And um, so this noise is uh, typically, it hasn't been studied as much in the cosmology literature because people just say, okay, we can absorb it with some constant in the power spectrum and bias spectrum. But it is in fact a much more rich and um, subtle but anyway, I, here I want just want to make like a broad brush statement that um, if I look on really large scales, fairly you know, if I choose my lambda sufficiently large scale, then this noise, the residual, will arise from the superposition of many small scale modes, right? All the modes above this cutoff, and then the central limit theorem says if I have something that's a superposition of many uh, individual independent modes, it is approximately Gaussian distributed and the larger the scale the more Gaussian it is so that already is a huge um, simplification right and I already know that the noise is close to Gaussian and so the second and then um, so if it's Gaussian that means I can describe it with a single power spectrum and so the the second point is what is that power spectrum and there I can use the fact that it arises from a local superposition right so that you know, the galaxy formation happens at a fixed point in space, so all the modes are superposed at a fixed kind of a, a, a small region in space, and that in turn implies that the power spectrum of the noise is white noise at low K. Okay. And with corrections that we know a scale as K squared, there's also a coupling between density and noise, but again, this is a perturbative expansion, and we know um, the relevance of each term at each order. So to those who are interested, uh, we have a, a, a substantial review on all of these topics. Um, just want to, I mean, many of you, uh, the experts probably already know this one. Good. So uh, that would take me to the second part of the talk. Is there, are there any questions on this first part? So I'm now going to be, again, more general, uh, less technical. So I don't see anything. Um, of course, happy to go back at the end of the talk. So now, um, okay, so I described we have this formalism for predicting galaxy clustering, but how do we infer cosmological parameters from this, right? So in cosmology, we're fundamentally um, in a situation where if you have a cosmological model, say inflation, single field inflation, plus some dark energy model, if you want, um, massive neutrinos, what we can, what we always can predict are the statistics of the initial conditions uh, from inflation, and then how a particular sample of these initial conditions evolves into the final density field. Right? Those are fundamentally the two things we uh, we know how to predict. 
And so this is, uh, and this is the reason why Bayesian inference is so natural in cosmology, because you say, uh, well, point one gives me a prior on the initial conditions on the initial matter density field that I call delta in here, which is a function in general of cosmological parameters. And then I have a deterministic forward model in the ideal world, right? If I could calculate everything, I would have a deterministic forward model for a given initial density field, which of course also depends on the cosmological parameters. So then, uh, you know, in the Bayesian uh, framework, this is all you need, right? So I can write down the posterior of cosmological parameters, given the data already, you know, in a formal way. So P of theta is the prior times uh, the likelihood of the observed, in my case, galaxy density field, but of course you could also think of cosmic microwave background or any other observable, given this forward modeled density field, right? So for a given uh, condition on a given initial condition, it's just the prior times this um, likelihood. And then I have to marginalize over my initial conditions because I don't have any independent information on those. So this is really always like in cosmology, this is what we want to calculate. And we always do some approximations to this. Basically, that's all of what cosmology inference is. So and it turns out that the prior uh, for the simplest inflationary models is actually very simple. It's just um, a multivariate Gaussian with a diagonal covariance in Fourier space. So in cosmology, we call that a Gaussian um, field. So this is um, straightforward to compute. Uh, the other part is obviously much more complicated because that contains all the physics. So even if I assume I have a perfect forward model for the matter distribution, you can think of n-body simulations, but even in the matter, there's baryonic effects. Um, but even if I have that, then I still need to compute the conditional probability of the observed galaxy density given the matter density field, right? And so this is... Um, in some sense, whatever we want to do with galaxy clustering, we need some um, typically simplified expression over this likelihood. And I wrote an additional marginalization here because as I mentioned, we have these in general free coefficients bias parameters that obviously um, we need to also marginalize over, maybe including some prior that I didn't write here. And then finally, the third uh, part is this massive functional integral. So this, of course, if you were to include all scales, this would be an infinite dimensional integral. In practice, we observe a finite volume in the universe. And also, we always have some smallness scale that we want to include. In this theory that I described earlier, it would be this cutoff lambda. So in the end, it turns out to be a finite integral, but it's a very high dimensional integral. So we're talking a million dimensions. So this is, I mean, currently there's no cosmology analysis that really does this because it's very, very difficult. Um, so, so what is the standard analysis doing? Well, you basically uh, do a data compression, right? You say, I, I don't aim to describe the entire galaxy density field. I um, identify some summary statistics that I believe contain a lot of cosmological information and I just compare those. Right, So then we replace basically this entire grid delta G with a much smaller data vector, for example, the galaxy power spectrum in K bins. So in this case, then the functional integral uh, basically uh, can be done uh, in a simpler, much simpler way because you um, have a much lower dimensionality in, in the data constraints. And so if you, there's one approach is the um, perturbation theory, um, at the endpoint function level, which is semi-analytically, so you do loop integrals um, semi-analytically. Um, the other approach is to base on simulations, to use simulations to predict power spectra, and then you basically run an ensemble of simulations which corresponds to doing this functional integral. Right? So basically, uh, I want to proceed now, however, without making this uh, massive compression. And conceptually, of course, um, well, for anyone familiar with with uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo inferences, I think it's conceptually simple. So we would, 
again, uh, we have a maximum wave number, so we can discretize the field on a finite lattice. The uh, initial conditions field we discretize on a finite lattice. Um, then we draw initial conditions from the prior, we forward evolve them, evaluate the likelihood, whatever it is, and um, compare with data and then accept or reject the sample, right? So that will be conceptually uh, how we do it. In practice, um, as I mentioned, we have, we're talking about a million or millions of parameters in this linear, in this initial conditions field. And if you just did a naive Markov chain Monte Carlo, you would never get anywhere because a random guess is uh, exponentially unlikely to describe your data well, right? So what we do instead is we do use Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, uh, which is a very neat technique. Uh, happy to discuss this later, but um, uh, we'll skip it in the interest of time. And of course, um, I should mention that we're not the only people doing this. Uh, there's Jens Yasha and Paco Kitaura were the first to start this. And um, there's a number of groups now uh, also trying this. Um, right. So the main physics ingredient that we need, though, for this is this galaxy likelihood, right? Uh, so even if we putting all the, you know, the technical difficulties of doing this at all aside, we definitely need um, this likelihood. We need to evaluate what's the probability of this observed galaxy density field given the forward evolved matter density field. And you know, as I said, I am um, quite convinced that this EFT approach is worth pursuing this idea of rigorously absorbing um, all the effects of galaxy clustering into a set of coefficients and just saying, I only attempt to uh, do things up to a scale lambda. So this is just a repeat of what I showed earlier. Uh, so we have this sharp K cut in the initial conditions. Um, we apply a sharp K filter. And then uh, the bias expansion, we basically just apply at the field level, right? So we have this, we have a single sample of the initial conditions. We forward evolve, in this case, also using perturbation theory, we construct the bias terms, you know, explicitly using some of these expressions I showed flashed earlier, and then we compare with the data. So, but we compare with the data at the, so for that, we need a field level likelihood but the nice thing is we already, we know a lot about this noise in the FT, right? We know that it's approximately Gaussian with a diagonal uh, covariance of Fourier space and white noise. And so basically it's, the likelihood is really conceptually very simple, right? We say my galaxy is this um, predicted field. That's a sum of these bias fields with three coefficients that I need to sample as well. And plus some noise. I have an expression for the noise PDF. It's a Gaussian with some lowest order. It's just a constant uh, covariance, shot noise, if you want. And uh, I just plug this expression in and I get the um, desired uh, probability of the galaxy density field given the forward modeled matter density field. So there's some subtleties that are uh, worth mentioning. So first of all, um, I'm summing over every single mode here. But it's a discrete sum because we have a finite volume, uh, right? I mean, every survey will have a finite volume. Um, obviously, the bigger the volume, the more modes you have. And the second uh, important point is that I only include modes up to this cutoff lambda, right? I'm not attempting to compare uh, pixel by pixel in real space. In this case, not pixel by pixel in real space. It's mode by mode in Fourier space. Um, and again, this delta G dead field is a sum of these bias fields. So just maybe it's clearer to show it as a flowchart. Um, so our forward model basically um, is a series of steps at the field level. So it's um, um, basically every operation is an operation on a grid. So we start with a sample of the linear density field that we filter on the scale lambda. Uh, I'll just call it delta lambda in the following. Um, then we do Lagrangian perturbation theory. That gives us Lagrangian bias fields. Then we displace them from Lagrangian to Eulerian space 
um, because I mean these these are some technical steps for the aficionados again. And then we have the final bias fields, and we plug that into the likelihood. Um, so conceptually, uh, quite easy, and everything is represented on a finite grid. We're not losing any of the modes; all of them are explicitly kept through the whole process. And so cosmology enters in this because, just to recall of what I said earlier, the prior depends on cosmological parameters. Um, the perturbation theory part, uh, the matter evolution depends on cosmological parameters. And then finally, in the likelihood, we have these bias parameters. So all of these need to be jointly sampled. And on the other side, we plug in the data. The data is basically just a density assignment from a halo catalog or a galaxy catalog, and then a grid reduction to reduce uh, because we don't, you know, we only need modes up to lambda. Do we do any smoothing in real space on the data? No, no. So it's all sharp K filtered. Well, there's so basically in the in the density assignment, there's a smoothing built in because you use some assignment grid assignment kernel, right? But it's uh, it's a very small scale. It's so it's not really relevant. So basically the name of the game then is to make this fast so that we can evaluate thousands of these forward models quickly. But um, let's see, um, how much time do I have left? 20 minutes. Okay, um, I think, yeah. So, so I wanted to show some results that, you know, I've been talking a lot about galaxies. Um, perfectly honest, we are not there yet, right? We're not able to apply to real galaxy surveys. We are using these um, bound objects made of dark matter as a mock galaxy tracer, but I'll show some, some results uh, based on simulated galaxies as well. So, so what we did is we started with simulations because first of all, in the simulations, you have everything under control. But the nice thing also is if I run a end body simulation, I put in a certain initial condition and that is this, I can use the same initial condition with, um, in my field level likelihood and just pretend someone gave me the initial conditions. And then I don't have to do the super expensive sampling of this giant field, right? So it's a very nice test case and it's very, it gives very precise constraints. So it's a good test of the Ford model. So, so basically the question we we try to address in this first step is to given a fixed initial conditions field can we infer cosmological parameters from a halo catalog where we pretend we don't know the cosmology that was used in the simulation um, so the advantage again is first of all we don't have to sample this gigantic field and second um, we have um, no cosmic variance because all the modes are are given and so um, the first thing, uh, the first cosmological parameter um, we're looking at is a sigma eight or AS or basically the normalization of the initial conditions. Okay, we assume we don't know what the normalization of the initial amplitude of density perturbations is. And that's uh, interesting because there is a bias coefficient, the well-known linear bias, which is exactly degenerate with this amplitude at linear order, right? So whatever we get out of this test will be from nonlinear information. And this is really, um, in the end, we want to go beyond linear order. So we're really um, interested in, in how reliable and how precise this nonlinear information can be accessed. And so this plot shows uh, the fractional deviation between the true sigma eight and the one inferred. Um, so it's a fairly compressed plot, but uh, let me walk you through it. So, um, so the y-axis is again this fractional deviation from the true sigma eight. So we want this to be to be zero, uh, and you can see it's within a few percent. All of these points are were derived using a fixed cutoff of lambda of 0.14. Okay, but at different orders in in perturbation theory. So what we want to see is that as um, precisely, I will ask the question uh, earlier. So what I want to see is that at fixed scales that I converge 
to the correct result as I increase the order, right? That's that's what I want to see. And now the the that priority to or the in terms of a biasing. Yeah, so this Lagrangian bias biasing. So then, for example, three as you came in, so you go all the way to the third order in bias. Yes. So actually, to be precise, the the integer here is the order in, in, in the matter perturbation theory. The O oh, here is the order in bias. Yeah. So, I mean, in principle, they should be at the same order, but um, yeah, I mean. So, yeah, and the Y, so the X axis here is some, um, is a way of comparing different halo samples. Um, again, our tracers are dark matter halos and simulations different halo samples with different masses, different redshifts in one plot, okay? So it's, um, don't worry too much about what this precise x-axis is. But you can see basically that um, for this cutoff value, we do see the expected convergence where generally speaking, of course there's some scatter and, um, but generally speaking, the higher order you go in perturbations, the better your results are. And so this is, if we can see something like that in real data, this would be, to me, very convincing that things are under control and we um, can really trust the cosmology we get out of that. Of course, higher orders become more expensive to evaluate. We have more free coefficients to, to a sample and so on. So it's um, also more difficult. I mean, one subtlety here is also that um, we still... At this point, when you're getting to percent level or sub percent level in the nonlinear information, right? Uh, it's the simulations also, and by simulations are not uh, completely exact, and in particular, transients from initial conditions could be a concern. And so, at some point, it's it's very hard to understand where the residual differences come from. Um, Right, so the same uh, applied now to uh, the illustrious TNG simulations. So um, Alex Barrera did this. He applied the same analysis pipeline. Given the initial conditions from the illustrious simulations, how well do we infer sigma eight? Um, and as I said, as I argued, the EFT approach should um, be, um, you know, it shouldn't matter whether you're looking at dark matter halos or galaxies. Um, it should always give the correct unbiased inference. And you can see here that this is really largely the case, except for the red galaxies at high redshift, which are very highly biased and low in number. So um, there's probably uh, the likelihood is not sufficient um, for this particular sample. But yeah, so it also works for simulated galaxies. Um, some more highlights, uh, again, all with fixed initial conditions. Uh, now we've been also, uh, with my student, Ivana Babich, we've been looking at uh, BAO inference. So for those who are familiar, um, in the measurement of the baryonic acoustic oscillation scale, which is a very nice standard ruler, allows us to measure distances in the, in the cosmos. The standard approach is to move, take galaxies, try to move them back to where they might have been in the initial conditions, and then run the analysis on that. This is probabilistically speaking not a nice approach because you need to assume a cosmology to do this moving back. So in the in this full inference approach, everything is forward, right? So you jointly do the reconstruction and sample cosmology. And so this was a sign again on dark matter halos. Um, you know, for a different um, this is a particular mass bin, but for different cutoff values and at different redshifts, we recover uh, the correct. BAO scale, uh, which at this point didn't surprise us because BAO is much easier to get right than uh, sigma eight. So it would be strange if sigma eight works and BAO doesn't. But what we are really interested in is what is the what is the error bar we can get from this, right? Can we improve on the all the current BAO analyses? And this was a little bit tricky because, again, we're fixing the initial conditions here. So it wouldn't be fair to compare to the standard analysis, which has no information on the initial conditions. So what we did was we restricted the um, power spectrum, the standard power spectrum analysis, 
um, you know, you can put in a covariance that corresponds to the knowledge of the initial conditions, which is what we did. So it is really a comparison uh, on a fair comparison on the same footing. And you can see here that, um, so this is the ratio of the error on the BAO scale inferred from the power spectrum approach to uh, the one from the field level. And for for low cutoffs on large scales, you basically recover that they give the same error bar, which makes sense because if at sufficiently large scales, everything is a Gaussian random field, the galaxies are a Gaussian random field. And uh, basically all the information is in the power spectrum. So we expect this convergence to happen. But then as you go to smaller scales, larger cutoff values, we see that we gain, have a significant improvement in the constraints by a factor of, um, you know, of order two. So this is a comparison with peak, uh, with the power spectrum without reconstruction. So it is known that doing reconstruction improves the error bar by 30, 40%. Um, so basically this, um, you know, this uh, number, if you compare it to reconstruction, it would be more like a factor 1.5, but still that will be enormous information gain. Um, but we will have to see how this works out once we actually sample the initial conditions. I can discuss more where this additional information would come from um, and so on. Another story is we can use this, um, this, I mean, instead of doing cosmology, we can also just measure bias coefficients. And for people interested in halo formation, uh, and uh, models for galaxy clustering that are based on halos. Uh, this is quite interesting because halo bias is one of the ingredients that goes in. And we found very strong assembly bias in the tidal bias coefficient, which is uh, also quite interesting. Happy to talk about this more in detail. So um, I'm almost at the end. Um, Obviously, I mean, I think for many of you who followed this, you will probably ask, well, fine, great, but how much of this remains once I actually sample the initial conditions? And absolutely, I fully agree. Uh, we are working on it. Um, and it's just difficult. And um, I think we are converging. Uh, so I hope to that we have some trustworthy results in the next few months. Um, which are looking promising currently, but um, yeah, so we're still working on it. But what I want to stress is that, you know, if you're if, if you follow the EFT approach, where you say I only trust, I only aim to describe the galaxies up to some fairly um, large scale, or down to some fairly large scale in real space, then this is the theoretical maximum of the information you can get. Right, because it includes all the you know individually mode by mode includes all the information. So whatever the outcome of that is, even if it's comparable to power spectrum plus bias spectrum, um, you know it's still good to know. I think so. Um, I think it's worth pursuing. So uh, to conclude, um, those were my two main messages. Um, the first one is that EFT provides a complete framework for galaxy bias, uh, which, however, does leave um, the possibility to constrain cosmology rigorously, and that there is a lot of additional information, but we don't know how much at this point. So thank you. <laughs>